In the southwest of the known world, nestled into a corner of the Sea of Dread, is a group of ten volcanic islands, rumoured to be filled with paradise and adventure. Born from fire, these islands are home to the kingdom of Irendi, a relatively new nation formed out of a mixture of fortune and entrepreneurialism. These islands appear to be an idyllic setting, beckoning travellers and adventurers to visit and dispense of their gold. But as with all shiny amusements, these islands hide a dark and sinister side, one of secret mages, piracy, and child trafficking? Hi, I'm Bakemi Berserker and welcome back to my channel. It's time to explore the fourth of the gazetteers that supported the known world, the Bekmi Dungeons & Dragons campaign world. Today we'll be looking at Gaz 4, the Kingdom of Irendi, a group of volcanic islands adorning the Sea of Dread. If you're new here, then welcome. This is where we explore the Beckme edition of Dungeons and Dragons, released between 1983 and 1986 in five boxed sets, and also as an amalgamated rulebook called the Rules Cyclopedia in 1991. If you wish to know more about Beckme, then please follow the link on the screen to my Beckme playlist. Gaz 4, The Kingdom of Irendi was written by Anne Gray McCready and published by TSR in 1987. It was a softcover book and had 64 pages. That's 32 less pages than the previous Gazetteer, but the same as both Gaz 1 and Gaz 2, so no real issue there. However, one does immediately notice that the typeface is larger than in all three of the previous Gazetteers. My immediate concern with this is that the reader is being offered less content than previously, due to the larger typeface taking up more real estate. However, I'll park these anxieties until the end and see how it goes. The cover art was once again by Clyde Caldwell, this time utilising shades of blue reminiscent of the ocean. What looks like a tribal adventurer wielding a menacing spear stands guard in the foreground, whilst what I assume to be an Eorendi citizen looks on and engages the viewer. She is adorned in jewellery obtained from the sea, her hair and makeup conveying strong Atlantean vibes. The difference in culture between these two is made obvious, making me wonder about their relationship. I think this is a clever use of imagery by the artist. Gaz 4, the Kingdom of Irendi, saw the return of the three-panel book cover that was present with Gaz 1 and Gaz 2. The inside contained a top-down perspective illustration of the castle of Irendi and also a map of one of the ten islands, called Honor Island, including a cross-section of the intriguing volcano Mount Kala, which is present there. On the rear of one panel is a hex map demonstrating where Irendi is in relation to its closest neighbours, although this does lack a scale. What isn't demonstrated at this stage is any mundane building designs to visually demonstrate what cultural architecture is like, although this is elaborated on later in the text. Gaz 4, the Kingdom of Irendi, was accompanied by an A1-sized colour map of the nation, detailing each of the kingdom's ten islands. Mercifully, this map is accompanied by the scale detailing each hex to equal eight miles that was missing from the maps in both Gaz 2 and Gaz 3. Also present on the map is an illustration of the city of Irendi, although the castle of Irendi is suspiciously absent from it. There's also information about the city's harbour wall defences, and also an illustration of an Irendi armoured fire ship, which makes up part of the nation's navy. Well, sort of. Speaking of the Irendi navy, Gaz 4 came with cardboard punched counters of ship types from all over the world, for use with the reverse of the A1 map. This was a table sized hex map made available for playing out naval battles with the counters provided, the rules for which were made available in the Gazetteer, which I will come on to later. I think this is a really nice touch, and a clear signal to anyone buying the Gazetteers in the 80s that no two products were going to be the same. Whether you were going to use the counters with the Gazetteer or not, you had the counters, and could now quite easily set up your own naval battles. Unfortunately, I bought my copy second hand, and the previous owner had used the counters, so I never actually had these to myself. Oh well, you can't have everything. Okay, so we've looked at the cover and the map. Let's look inside. The contents of the book were separated into numerous chapters that served three specific functions. The first was to introduce us to the Kingdom of Irendi, made up of 17 pages detailing its geography, economy and society. The second section was made up of 38 pages focused on the ten islands and their characteristics. The third section is called the pull-out section, which I'm pretty sure not many people pulled out, 
offering eight pages detailing the naval combat rules I alluded to earlier, and also a bizarre travel brochure designed to entice adventurers to the islands. Okay, so what are my first impressions of this book? Well, apart from being disappointed with the obvious increase in typeface to fill out the pages, and despite the inclusion of counters and a mini naval war game, I think the premise is, to be blunt, a bit wacky. Although this gazetteer does have some obvious bits of interest that I want to dig into, the kingdom of Irendi is framed as a tourist destination. Something like a fantasy island populated by Pacific-like and other known world cultures. This is quite a diversion from the peril and danger of the lands described in the previous three gazetteers. From the outset, Gaz 4 feels frivolous, and I can't help wondering if the production team were feeling the strain, given the number of publications they were churning out in such a short timescale. Making Iarendi a tourist destination smacks of running out of ideas, and that's a real shame, given that 40 years later the known world is getting some love. But at this stage, I just can't give this a pass. But who knows, maybe the contents will redeem it. Let's dive in and see. The first few pages are dedicated to setting out the Kingdom of Iarendi's history, and I have to say, after reading this a number of times, I feel I have more questions than answers. However, let's go through the timeline Beck Me Berserker style, and I'll add my tuppence afterwards. But just to say, I might refer to an island's name here or there, but I'll expand on these a bit later. As with all gazetteers so far, we are informed of the Great Reign of Fire that caused the destruction of Blackmore in 3000 BC, a highly technological culture which was destroyed following the shifting of the planet's axis. As Bronze and Iron Age cultures began to develop across the continent that was to become the known world, volcanic instability in the southern coastal regions resulted in a cataclysmic explosion. A landmass sitting off the south coast, called the Kikianu Caldera, erupted around 2000 BC, ejecting its magma skyward, whilst the sea rushed in to fill the void. This led to the region being completely flooded, with only a few areas remaining above sea level. By around 1700 BC, these areas formed some of what today make up the Ten Islands of the Kingdom of Irendi. Two cultures appear to have survived this tumultuous event, not without terrible difficulties, no doubt. These were the Makai, a primitive human tribe reminiscent of Pacific Islanders, and a Lizardman tribe, descended from those found in the Malfegi Swamp on the mainland. Both cultures coexisted on the islands for hundreds of years before they were discovered by seafarers from the expansive Nithian Empire, around 1000 BC. The Nithians dominated the coastal Makai and settled in those regions, but never successfully conquered the interior, which remained held by the Lizardmen. However, the animals that the Nithians brought to the island carried a disease that decimated the Lizardman population. After years of declining population due to terrible infections, the Lizardmen invoked immense magical powers through their immortal patron and destroyed every Nithian settlement in a single night. This happened around 500 BC. No details remain on how exactly this was achieved, but the tale remains one that Makai Shaman retell with every generation. Although the Lizardmen were supposedly doomed to extinction, some remain isolated and withdrawn in the deepest, darkest corners of the swamps of Royster Island, or in the coastal shelves of the sea. This event happened around the same time as the collapse of the Nithian Empire, and the islands that were to become Irendi, as well as its Makai inhabitants, subsequently enjoyed a relatively trouble-free period of around 1,000 years, before a dysfunctional group of convicts sentenced to death on the open sea by officials from the Five Shires, made landfall in 570 AC. Many ignorant Irendi citizens believe their history started from this point, and that these convicts quickly assimilated with the Makai, whilst sharing their own technology, when in actuality this event was pretty much incidental. The truth is that the Empire of Thyatis discovered the islands around 571, and wished to use them as a penal colony for political dissidents. Many of the Makai withdrew to inland settlements to avoid contact with the Thyatians, as they treated them poorly. The penal colony was fully operational for almost 30 years when things came to a head in 600 AC, when an ambitious pirate called Mad Krieg inspired a rebellion by the prisoners. His charismatic personality also won over the Makai, and with a mixture of clever tactics and the greasing of palms, by 602 AC, Mad Krieg had overthrown the Thyatians and proclaimed himself monarch of the Ten Islands, making up the newly named Kingdom of Irendi. 
with Thyatis having signed a treaty to declare their formal withdrawal. Mad Krieg ruled until 637, when his son, Black Toes, inherited the throne. In the same year, he married a Glantrian woman called Kerhi Matrongal, establishing the Matrongal dynasty. By 642, Black Toes had established what was called the Council of Lords, a cabal of henchmen and advisers which was not as formal as it might have appeared to outsiders. The Council of Lords set about establishing a framework of laws, albeit a bit rough and ready. What's important to note here is that in the preceding years, a mysterious group of magic users had arrived at Honor Island around 640 and settled there. These would grow into a powerful society outside of the influence of the rulers of Iarendi, but coming to its defence when needed. Honor Island remains a place only accessible by invitation to this day, even to the present king and queen. During the same period, the Thiatians ripped up their treaty by launching successive naval attacks against the islands. It is during this period that the magic users of Honor Island demonstrate their support for Iarendi, and Thyatis is defeated once more. This prompted the development of the Iarendi navy, which established itself as one of the strongest in the known world, bolstered by magical armoured fire ships out of Honor Island. These fire ships remain under the command of Honor Island to this day but come to Iarendi's aid when required. In 775, there is a major uprising by merchants against the power wielded by the monarchy. This results in a major shift in power, with the seats of the king and queen no longer being dynastic, but being made democratically available. That is, the citizens of Iarendi may vote for their rulers on an annual basis. Not content with that, the most influential of islanders formed the Council of Citizens in 790 and the annual elections become a traditional time for celebration. By 867, the Council of Lords proposed that the selection of king and queen should no longer be conducted democratically, but that the thrones should be competed for in what is named the Royal Tournament of Adventurers, a set of contests that over the subsequent years has developed into an annual free-for-all for the crown of Iarendi, as long as competitors swear allegiance to the nation. The administration of this contest includes the input of the magic users of Honor Island. In 980 AC, the Council of Lords and the Council of Citizens merged to form the Iarendi Tribunal, to oversee all royal matters. The council consists of both elected individuals and those selected by the current king and queen. Today it is 1000 AC. King Palfrit and Queen Marianne sit on their thrones, the current winners of the Royal Tournament of Adventurers. There is no obligation to form a relationship beyond this, and both live within the castle of Irendi, surrounded by the administrative arm of the tribunal, overseeing the needs of the nation. Normally when I reach the end of a timeline like this, I continue straight into the next subject matter, but I feel there's so much to unpick here that wasn't included in the history section of the Gazetteer. For instance, where did the name Irendi come from? It just appears when Mad Krieg proclaims himself king. Nowhere is this explained in the Gazetteer, and the naming is in no way obvious in the same way as with previous Gazetteers. Was it a Thiatian name for the penal colony? Who knows? Without this context, it just seems random and contrived, and I have a real dislike for that in world building. Also, why did the merchants rise up and demand a democratic monarchy to replace the dynastic one? This isn't explained, and why on earth throw away the effort of that work by installing a system of being ruled by random adventurers winning rulership over you. I know this is fantasy, but this is just silly. Finally, there is very little explanation of who the Makai are. They are there in the history of the islands, but they just seem to serve no purpose in the world building apart from just being there. I'm hoping this will change as I delve further into the book. So after being introduced to the strange history of Iarendi, we are given several pages about its geography. As I mentioned earlier, the kingdom of Iarendi was born out of a cataclysmic volcanic explosion. But before I go into this any deeper, I feel it's time to at least list the names of the nation's ten islands, along with what they're currently known for, as my continued reference to them may otherwise be confusing. Going in alphabetic order, first there is Alcove Island, offering organised treasure hunting cruises seeking sunken pirate treasure. Second, there is Aloysius Island, once a large part of the penal colony and now mainly residential. Next, there is Elegy Island, which contains the ancient 
sacred burial grounds of the Mackay, which should be respected by visitors. Then there is Fletcher Island, where you might get practically anything made with feathers. Then we have Honour Island, to which there is no admittance, and is home to the Honour Island mages. Iarendi Island is the largest of all the ten islands and comprises of the nation's governing body and so-called monarchy. This place is pretty much your classic island getaway, with marketplaces and boat tours, should your adventurer want to partake. Royster Island is much more of a backwater and more suited for relaxing and fishing. Then there is Safari Island, the second largest island and home to wilderness tours and what are called safe adventures for those wanting the feeling of danger without the consequences. Utter Island is home to a strange albino population who practice incredible feats of building homes out of sand. And finally there is White Island, a monastic retreat which allows no admittance as is home to the White Knight Abbey Druids. So that's the ten islands of the Kingdom of Iarendi. Let's return to its geography. Obviously the islands are surrounded by ocean, specifically the Sea of Dread. Every one of the ten islands is home to volcanic activity, so one would imagine that they would experience frequent seismic activity, but this is not mentioned at all, so it would be something I would allude to myself if I were to run a campaign here. As part of the description of the islands, we are told that four of them, these being Honor, Elegy, Royster and Fletcher, are the last vestiges of the Kikianu caldera that exploded 3,000 years earlier. As you can tell, the Kikianu caldera must have been absolutely huge. I counted the hexes from the shores of Elegy to Honor Island and got 27. 27 times 8 is 216. That's a caldera 216 miles wide. To put the Kikianu into context against a real world eruption, Krakatoa Island was about 5 miles wide before it was destroyed by the eruption in 1883 and the power of that eruption is approximated to be four times more than the most powerful thermonuclear device ever detonated. So by that reckoning, I'm not sure the known world should be here at all, but I'm not a geophysicist, so what do I know? Let's hand wave it for now. Oh wait, I can't. Look at this map. Iarendi Island is in the middle of the extinct caldera that we were just told only left Elegy, Fletcher, Honor and Royster Islands behind above sea level. So how do we account for Iarendi Island being there? Or even White Island for that matter? The geographic and topographic explanations get worse the more we dig into the text. When explaining the terrain and climate of the arid uplands of the kingdom, reference is made to an area called the Makalawi Crater, but its location is never explicitly stated. There is a village on Iarendi Island called Makalawi, so it seems reasonable to assume it's around there, but the text goes on to describe the area as being a desert-like basin filled with steaming geysers, the floor of which is 15 miles in diameter at an elevation of 9,000 feet. With each hex on this map being just 8 miles, surely the crater should have made its way on the map. Worse though is the mention of a 9,000 feet elevation. That's 9,000 feet above sea level. So not only do we have a large island where an earlier description of the Kikianu caldera suggested there shouldn't be one, but now it has areas that are at least 9,000 feet above sea level. I understand that this kind of formation might occur in a caldera formed from a meteor strike, but not from a volcanic eruption which evacuated its contents and then exploded. Putting aside the contradictory text and map descriptions, how would you explain the appearance of Irendi Island? I think I would just say the Kikianu collapsed on itself and left behind what was to become Irendi and White Islands. It seems reasonable enough but I've had to ignore the text, which I have purchased, to decide this. I know I'm labouring this, but I have a real issue when it comes to information not adding up, even if it is fictional. I believe that if you buy a product, it should be as tight as possible, especially when referring to a map. The production crew really didn't join up the dots, and my impression of this product overall is continuing to decline. So, putting aside the issues I just mentioned, the section on the kingdom's geography continues with reference to climate and wildlife in the uplands, rainforests, swamps and plains. In addition, we get a nice, if too short, reference to lava badlands that I would have liked some expansion on. There is mention of honeycombed tunnels and the types of creatures rumoured to live in these areas, which might be enough for many DMs to work with, but I think a big trick has been missed in not exploiting the volcanism of these islands as being the main offer of this gazetteer, which instead focused on whimsical tourism. Another aspect that might have been explored further 
could have been focusing on the merman cultures that live under the sea within the coastal shelves of the islands. I think this is touched on more in PC3, The Sea Peoples, released in 1990, but again, in my opinion, it's a subject matter that appears poorly exploited here. After a cursory mention of the flora and fauna of the islands, we are introduced to what's referred to as the Hall of Fame, detailing the stats and background of a number of contemporary NPCs. Six NPCs, in fact. Yes, just six. We had 44 in Gaz 1, which had the same page count, yet here we have only six. Leafing through the entire book, there is not a single further NPC stat block. We have mention of other NPCs, sometimes but rarely accompanied by a class and level, but no other detail. In fact, the so-called Hall of Fame takes up a single page in the entire book. I don't know about you, but NPCs are the critical element to any campaign world building, and just having six is a paltry offer in my opinion. It restricts the establishment and machinations of political intrigue, as without NPCs, there is no framework to operate in, no guidance about who stands for what. This feels like a void in this book that, if I were to fill it, would just have me changing the entire premise of the islands. As things are going, I don't think this would be a bad thing. So we've been introduced to the main NPCs of the island, all six of them. Now let's look at how the government of Irendi is supposed to work. We are told that the government of Irendi is comprised of a king and queen, and an administrative body called the tribunal. Although the monarchs can theoretically proclaim the laws of the land, the execution of the law is in the hands of the tribunal and subordinate ministries. As nothing may be accomplished without this support, the tribunal holds the real power in the kingdom. As mentioned earlier, the king and queen of Irendi are chosen on an annual basis out of the highest scoring winners of the Royal Tournament of Adventurers, although the tribunal has final say. The winning king and queen reside in the castle of Irendi and are paid a total of 500 platinum pieces per year for the pleasure. There is not a limit on how long you may be king or queen as long as you keep winning the annual tournament. The tribunal is where the real power is. This is a bureaucratic body that takes care of the day-to-day -day affairs of the nation. In truth, the monarchy is a distraction in terms of where people might think the power of decision-making lies. The real power is delivered through the tribunal's five governmental departments. These being the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Department of Customs and Assessment, Department of Internal Affairs, and the Department of Military Affairs. The law in Irendi is established through royal proclamations and ratified through the tribunal. Due to the fluidity of the Irendi monarchy, many laws are contradictory. The system seems to work on the basis of fair play rather than any rigid criteria. It's a bit fast and loose, but I guess it could be fun if running games in this environment. Although the guard is responsible for applying some kind of law and order in Irendi, such as what I've put up on the screen, they are not exactly known for their reliability and many are corruptible. If people want real justice, they end up turning to the numerous adventurers on the island, who they pay to do a job and keep their mouths shut. And so we are given an insight into why Irendi is so popular with adventurers. It's not just the weird promise of tourism, it's the opportunity for bounty hunting, and with an inept guard in place that is more for show than effectiveness, there is plenty of work available, and plenty of opportunity to get away with it. As I mentioned earlier, the King and Queen of Irendi are chosen from the winning participants of the annual Royal Tournament of Adventurers. However, those who were unsuccessful are invited to join an organisation called the Adventurers Club. Headquartered in the city of Irendi, membership of the Adventurers Club may only be accessed by being nominated and then this being agreed to by the monarchs and the royal court. Those able to join are awarded the title Kia'i, meaning Guardian. Club members may live and eat free of charge at the club's various chapter houses across the islands, and membership must be renewed each year through participation of the Royal Tournament. In addition, members must accept two quests per year for no pay, demonstrating some kind of public service to the citizens of Irendi. Furthermore, members must accept calls for help by the monarchs if the nation is in need. I like the idea of an adventurer's club, I just can't help wondering why anyone would want to be a member of this one. Membership seems to be more of a burden than anything else. You must take part in the tournament, and you must work for free here and there, and you could be called on by the king or queen at any time. One would assume you would get access to lucrative contracts, but that's not mentioned. 
so a DM would probably implement this feature themselves. That said, there is already a system for this elsewhere in Irendi, which I will get to later. So having a strong reason to become a member of the Adventurers Club, as written, is absent in my opinion. As I've mentioned a number of times, the economy of Irendi is heavily centred on tourism. What was once a hive of pirate activity has settled into a routine of welcoming foreign visitors for the purposes of bleeding them for cash. On the subject of cash, throughout the kingdom the platinum piece is called a pali, a gold piece is called a galeba, and a silver piece is called a sana, and a copper piece is called a kokip. There is no mention of electrum at all. Visitors to the island are warned of being careful when accepting ERND coinage, as counterfeiting is a frequent problem. Apart from tourism, the islands have an export economy in jewellery and some precious metals, as well as salt and cotton. Without much land for grazing, the islands are dependent on imports for things like meat and leather, and even iron needs to be imported. Overall, food is otherwise abundant in the warm conditions of Irendi, with many Makai communities living the primitive existence they've always led, fishing and living off the land. We are told that Irendi society is mostly made up of Makai cultural traditions without any real in-depth information about what this means. Life is slow and relaxing, with a minimalistic approach to work. We are given information about the clothing that Irendi citizens wear, what they eat, and even what the local architecture is like, although there are no specific illustrations of this. In essence, Irendi homes of most of the population seem to be simple wooden frameworks with clay walls and thatched roofs. We are told that it is customary in ERND society to gather at night after a day's work, which can lead to some rowdy encounters, but it is mostly good-natured. However, the strangest custom has to be what are called skill breaks. These are afternoon breaks where islanders stop working to take part in mock battles, such as hand-to-hand -hand combat or some form of sharp shooting. Try and imagine a scheduled pillow fight every day, where the population goes nuts, and that's something like what the skill break is. Whilst a quaint custom in concept, I'm sure anyone involved in this would get tired of it pretty quick. I mean, we see such things in the real world, but these tend to be annual activities, not every single day. I think that's what I'd do with the idea if I was running a game in ERND. There are two more aspects of ERND society I want to cover before I give you my thoughts on a couple of big misses. The first is ERND holidays. These are as follows. The Days of Right, the Rebirth, and the Celebration of the Sea. The Days of Rite is a three-day festival that covers the winter solstice and celebrates a prophesied birth of what is termed a Rite, that is, a hero that will be sent by the immortals to save all mankind. Apparently, this hero has not turned up yet, but the people celebrate regardless, despite the prophesied date having already passed. The time of year and the messaging is obviously a twist on Christmas, especially as it's a time to make amends and share gifts and the people of Irendi have focused on this more than any realisation of a prophecy. The rebirth is a spring holiday that joins the people together in great planting ceremonies in the spring to ensure that fields are sown in good time. It lasts a few days and is exhausting, but it is a source of national pride to take part. The celebration of the sea is conducted in the autumn following the harvest. Hundreds of boats are tied together to form great floating platforms on which many parties are had, the significance of the sea is a celebration of water bringing the harvest and also food to the people and to appease legendary sea monsters who could flood the land, although no one has actually seen these sea monsters. The two-day celebration culminates in some winter planting activity before the holiday is over. Whilst these holidays are interesting to read about, what is absent is any reference to a calendar, so without knowledge of what's in the previous gazetteers, one might assume the use of the Gregorian calendar and that might be fine and dandy in isolation. However, the known world uses a perfect lunar calendar, probably too perfect in my opinion, but that's by the by. I think it would have been really useful to list the months of the year here, and demonstrate when these holidays actually occurred, and how they fitted around the rest of the year. The last aspect of Irendi society I wanted to cover is religion. We are told that the Makai worship the immortals using various druidic principles, However, it is two core religions brought by immigrants from the known world that are covered in the Gazetteer, each having an established church. These are the People's Temple and the Eternal Truth. The most widely attended church is the People's Temple, which has its guiding principles inscribed on pieces of stone called the Hope Stones, the location of which is currently unknown to most people. However, the religion is quite informal, ensuring its popularity, and services are usually open air and consist of good-natured gatherings 
where messages of the day are shared. No god or immortal is actually spoken of or revered, only the presence of a force around us that should be used for positive effect. If I was to sum it up, I'd say that the People's Temple is a bit of a hippie religion, not too out of step with the whole Pacific Island vibe, kind of like one of those retreats some people might end up spending a lot of money on to find their inner peace. Good times. The eternal truth of al Kalim has its roots in Ilarum, and has made its way to Irendi through traders and adventurers. It has a rather small following, which is still a surprisingly large group, given the strictness of the religion's tenets. Worshippers of the eternal truth look down on people temple worshippers as directionless and lacking a moral code. There is even the potential that some wish to spread their religion by the sword. I'll not go into much more detail about what the eternal truth is, except to put a link on the screen to my video about the Emirates of Ilarum, which goes into this religion in more detail. So that's the first section of the book, covering government, economy and society. What is glaringly absent is any in-depth exploration of the Makai themselves. Who are they? What skills do they have? What are their values? Although we have the Makai in the background as an ever-present, quaint Pacific culture, there is very little written of their culture to learn about. They're on the periphery rather than being front and centre. It's almost as if they're incidental. We're just given words like Aboriginal and Native, and I guess the thinking was that we filled the gaps in what those words meant. It's a real shame, because I was looking forward to learning about the Makai and what they might offer in terms of game options. And that brings me on to my next gripe. At no point are we offered rules for playing a member of Irendi society, whether Makai or otherwise. What makes an Irendi citizen Irendi is woefully absent, especially when setting up a backdrop of adventuring as being a major source of trade. I was looking forward to doing my usual section on rolling an indigenous character, but I guess I have to forego that in lieu of having the information. Let's move on. So earlier I listed the 10 islands, and the rest of the book, apart from the pullout section, which I'll do at the end, is dedicated to detailing each one to some extent or another. So let's go exploring. I'll go in the order the book presents them, thereby saving the best till last. The first is Irendi Island, the largest island and home to the capital city. Irendi Island has a population of almost 40,000 people, rising to over 55,000 in the peak tourist season. We are told that resorts are spread throughout the island, but the bulk of information given is centred on the city of Irendi, comprised of many different shops of interest, including a flying carpet store. The harbour wall protects several marinas offering boat services and numerous restaurants line the streets. And then there is of course the intimidating adventuring club headquarters, an impressive keep in amongst all the hustle and bustle. Somewhere in or around the city is the castle of Irendi. I wish I could tell you where, but it isn't on the map, and there isn't an indication of which direction it lies. That's a shame, because we are told that it is an impressive structure made entirely from coral harvested from the sea. Also, it has an important feature known as the postings on the north wall, where news and messages may be posted on the north wall of the castle, as well as job advertisements, especially for adventurers, rendering the need to join the adventurers club almost meaningless. The proximity of these types of communications to people who might read them suggests the castle would be easily accessible, but as it isn't present on the map of the city, one can't be sure where it is. The text says that it is on a raised portion of land that is prominent for all to see, so perhaps it was meant to be where the Naval Academy is. I don't know. I can only think that this is a glaring omission, and a frustrating one at that. Other than this, the information on the city of Irendi introduces us to three NPCs for hire, or who might hire the party, albeit without stat blocks. These are a halfling called Asta of Reddenshire, a thief called Miki Haumekia Mate Uipua, and a magic user called Bargle. Don't get excited, apparently it isn't that Bargle, it's his less famous nephew. We're given some cursory text to work with in terms of developing a reason to use these guys, but not much more. I guess they might be useful, but there isn't an offer here that makes their placement worthwhile, and introducing us to Bargle Jr. is just a bit strange. A magic user by any other name might have been preferable. Otherwise this is just confusing and serves no purpose except to make you sit up at the name, only to feel deflated afterwards. We're going to leave Irendi Island now and sail east to Safari Island, home to over 5,000 islanders. Safari Island is referred to as a virtual paradise that is home to numerous wilderness preserves 
that may be explored. The text states that there are many creatures here that are extinct elsewhere in the known world, so we are told it could be a good place to obtain rare magical components. Otherwise, Safari Island is home to what's referred to as adventure parks. The most famous of these is Gastonou's World of Adventure. Stick with me, guys. A place where visitors may participate in safe adventures where they are in no real danger. The text introduces us to contrived magical weapons and defences, which, for all intents and purposes, reduces encounters to elaborate LARP events. There are a couple of nice maps in the book which are used to describe two World of Adventure scenarios, but essentially this format is really put together to enjoy playing an adventure without any risk to your characters. Remember, they're on holiday. I'll give my thoughts on this at the end. Sailing west a bit, and we arrive at Alcove Island, with its population of 1,200 islanders. The eastern side of the island is home to a hidden pirate cove, which houses a community of pirates whilst being large enough to also hide their ships. Frustratingly, we are not provided with a map of this huge cavern, a place I think that would have had excellent adventuring potential. Many famous pirates have made this cove home, and the Eerendi Navy patrol the area frequently. This location has excitement written all over it, but needs significant development beyond what's in the book to take full advantage of it. On the west of Alcove Island is the bay, where many tourists go to take part in underwater searches for pirate treasure, as part of commercially packaged treasure hunting tours. There are also a number of food stands in this area owned by a mysterious woman called Verta Longbraid, who sells fruit and vegetables and sweets for children. Not many people know about Verta and her background, but, frighteningly, she is in the business of capturing lost children and selling them to pirates. The text describes that she hides her merchandise in the hills and awaits the pirates to visit, who buy the healthy ones and put them to work, or ransom them. God knows what's done with the unhealthy ones. Perhaps not a subject that would get anywhere near a modern D&D product, but I'll return to this in my wrap-up. Now we'll sail southeast to Utter Island, home to 3,000 islanders, over a third of which are albino. This albino group, which I presume is human, the text doesn't say, is said to be above average in intelligence and have developed their own religious culture focusing on constructing homes for their immortal patron. Which one? We're not told. Although it is said that a well-designed structure would earn the builder eternal life after death. These structures are only made of sand, with coral and colour sometimes added. What are referred to as spiritual gurus then concoct a special substance that when added to the surface of the structure gives it the consistency of stone. The method of this concoction is a secret these gurus take to the grave, quite literally if pressed, as they can will themselves dead to protect the secret. Talk about dying for your art. Sailing west again and we make landfall at White Island, with its meagre population of just over 100 islanders. Access to this island is allowed only on special admittance. The population of the island are referred to as the White Knight Druids, and reside at White Knight Abbey. But these druids no longer have any semblance of sanity, trapped between a waking and dreaming world, during which they shape change into white apes that roam the island during the night, returning to the abbey before sunrise. Why are they here? Well, apparently they are worshippers of Orisis, the immortal of death and resurrection, originally worshipped in the ancient Nithian Empire. Orisis has been able to transport some of his worshippers from his own immortal realm back to the known world, for some reason that isn't given in the text, together with the instruction never again to speak to anyone outside of their cult, again for some reason that isn't explained in the text. Apart from this, there isn't much more of interest here, unless adventurers are determined to rid the world of Orisis worshippers. We do get some information about a couple of new creatures though, for which we are given stat blocks. These are the Ether Weird, a creature from the ethereal plane that causes insanity, and the Birch Dove, which are special creatures who are vessels for the souls of the druids who have passed on. Sailing south by southwest from White Island, and we reach Royster Island. This ironically named island is a place of rest and relaxation, and follows, perhaps more than any other island in the kingdom, the Mackay way of life. There is very little that is explored in the text other than that, but we are offered two spell effects that the Mackay have developed to keep themselves safe, and which may be in demand should intrepid adventurers ever need them. The first is called Doze, which is a spell cast on specially treated breadfruit, causing a single slice of the breadfruit to have the same effect as a sleep spell, lasting 5d6 turns. The second is called Mau Mau Bane. 
Mau Mau means sick sick and is a disease carried by numerous mosquito type insects turning victims into mindless zombies. Mau Mau Bane works as a cure disease effect delivered as a powder that is pumped out of a bamboo tube. The powder fills the air in a hundred foot radius and any nearby insects explode in the mist. Any victims of Mau Mau in the mist are also cured of the disease. I don't know about Mau Mau, but I'd love some of that powder to keep the wasps at bay. Sailing east, we come to Aloysius Island, home to over 2,000 islanders. This island was once a major part of the Thiatian penal colony, and it is still used this way by the tribunal today. In addition, new gold mines and gem deposits have recently been discovered, and the tribunal is trying to entice a population of miners to the island. This is despite the island having a recent Mau Mau epidemic. This hasn't stopped several hundred dwarves being attracted to the island and having begun a trade in unique jewellery that is in some demand. Deep in the interior of the island is a raider settlement. Led by Manny Blackcheek, we are told that these raiders make forays into Mackay villages and occasionally the main village of Jorton, before retreating back to their hideout. Manny leads 50 escaped convicts in all and his hideout is rumoured to be impenetrable. Sailing to the northwest of the kingdom, we come to Elegy Island, home to nearly 3,000 islanders. Elegy Island was once the sacred burial ground of the Mackay before settlers appeared around 600 AC. It is said that the Mackay from across all the other islands would make the trip by canoe to bury their dead, usually with their wealth. This seems a little noble to my Machiavellian brain and I wonder how many boats actually reached their destination and how many Mackay corpses were thrown overboard to lie at the bottom of the sea. Putting my cynicism to one side, this tradition, the one of burying your dead, not throwing them overboard, led to a glut of grave robberies once the Mackay became less interested in their cultural roots. Visitors of the island may come across a seemingly ageless Mackay shaman called Jamie Honeycreeper Ahua. Jamie can be hard to find, but I would absolutely make him part of any campaign in Ierendi, for Jamie is a neutral lich who may become an ally of an adventuring party. He is suspected of also being a custodian for many treasure troves of the dead to keep them safe from grave robbers, so says he. So be careful that any thief characters in the party don't cock things up for the rest of you. Sailing eastwards across the tip of Irendi Island and we come to Fletcher Island, a destination famous for its abundance of birds of many a feather. The local population called Fletcherites are known for their skill at making anything out of feathers and there's even a rare form of crystal that may be found on the island called fire starters, which may harness the sun's rays to start a fire. There are no specifics around the mechanics of this, so I would equate the item to flint and tinder, and not something on the level of crazy pyrotechnics. What isn't mentioned is any reference to special or magical arrows that might have been made on this island. Being called Fletcher Island, I think this is a missed opportunity. It might have been really interesting to learn of an old Mackay tradition of fletching that, for instance, allows arrows to travel underwater at the same speed as in the air. Ideas like this could have really fleshed out the place. Now, there are also two residences on Fletcher Island that just have me shaking my head in dismay. If you're from Generation X and don't know what's coming, bear with me. The first is referred to as Mr. Cork's residence. Home to a Glantrian elf from Belcadiz, Mr. Cork invites guests to stay at his residence, where he is able to stage fictitious environments for them to enjoy so that they may live out their wildest fantasies. Mr. Cork shuttles guests from the nearby settlement of Vlad by flying carpet, and his valiant gnome assistant keeps watch for it returning, screaming, See carpet! See carpet! whenever it comes into sight. How original. Then there is Papuna Mansion, which belongs to an absent Thiatian trader, but is looked after and maintained by a retired Thiatian army officer called, wait for it, Sir Iggins accompanied often by his two black dogs, who are used as a form of physical deterrent. Also resident at the mansion is a man from the Sodiford Yaldums called Magnus, who helps Sir Iggins keep the place safe. We are told that Magnus rides around in a red chariot and is often seen with his two friends, Dizzy, who operates the flying carpet surface for Mr. Cork, and Crick, who owns a bar on the beach serving tourists. Halcyon days. Seriously, this is just dreadful. If you haven't identified the parodies here, let me point them out to you. The premise for Mr. Cork is a direct lift from a TV series in the 70s and 80s called Fantasy Island, where a Mr. Rourke hosted guests to, guess what, act out their fantasies. He also had an assistant with dwarfism who would declare, the plane, the plane, whenever new guests were arriving. 
I'm not sure how Peter Dinklage would feel about this part being reduced to that of a gnome. Best not go there. As for Papuna Mansion, this is a parody of the 80s TV series called Magnum P.I. That's P.I. for Private Investigator. The premise is pretty much identical, except that Magnum had a red Ferrari as opposed to Magnus's red chariot, whilst T.C. had a helicopter instead of a flying carpet. Rick still had a bar, though, and Mr. Higgins still had those pesky dogs that used to scare the bejesus out of me. What was the point of all this? Why did MacReady think that this would be appropriate? As if this product couldn't sink any lower, it literally starts to make fun of itself. Let's sail to the centre of the kingdom to our tenth and final island, Honor Island. I'll state immediately that this island is the most interesting place in the whole kingdom. Admittance is not allowed to anyone without prior permission, but I've got my elven cloak and my elven boots on, so I'm hoping no one will detect me. We are told that Honor Island is home to 2,000 spellcasters, 4,000 goblin slaves, and over 50,000 fire elementals. The island was colonised in the 7th century by refugees from Alphacia, though we are not told what they were fleeing from. In return for being left alone, they come to the kingdom's aid when it is under threat, turning the tide of many battles over its history, especially with the invention of the armoured fire ship, of which they have a small fleet that remains under their control. Although some islanders worry about the ultimate intentions of the Honor Island mages, in terms of political ambitions, in actuality they just want to be left alone. Why? Because they have discovered that a volcano on the island called Mount Color hides a couple of gates to the ethereal plane and the elemental plane of fire. These relate to the map on the inside cover I showed you earlier. We are treated to quite a bit of interesting information about the population of Honor Island, such as the fact that, out of all the spellcasters, 35% are clerics, 5% are druids, and the rest are magic users. Spellcasters go through a curriculum of learning that generally puts them at around 10th level by the age of 25. Much of this curriculum is spent beyond the prime plane. We are also told that the mages of Honor Island are encouraged into specialisms and research after this age, although what these might be are not offered. However, we are informed that not many spellcasters go beyond 20th level whilst studying this way. Still, that makes Honor Island a formidable place for anyone to be found visiting. Regrettably, we are informed that Honor Island runs its own tourist industry. Just when I thought when things were on the up. Inviting beings from the elemental plane of fire to look around the island and stare at the sea. In a way, this is even more bizarre, as the mages allow beings from another plane to visit the island, but not beings from its own plane. Very strange. Okay. So those were the ten islands, a veritable mix of some interesting sights and plenty of nonsense. But before I go into my wrap-up, let's just cover that pull-out section I mentioned earlier. The pull-out section comprised of eight pages, four of which were allocated to detailing the Eerendi military, and rules for naval combat that could utilise the cardboard counters that came with the gazetteer. There is some brief text about the Eerendi Naval Academy and how the navy is deployed across the islands, as well as information on the guard. There is some interesting text about how a citizen might join the navy, and a player might use this information for character setup when designing their background. Otherwise, it's just flavour. We are told what the navy setup is for the kingdom, being overseen by an admiral, Jaron Kindle, and consisting of over 36 ships, over 20 of which are galleys and sail ships of various sizes, complemented by 12 armoured fire ships from Honor Island. We are told that the rest are made up of privateers. The guard is found on all Irendi territories, apart from Honor Island, and is made up of two forces. These are the regular force, making up the bulk of the guard, and the Royal Brigade, an elite corps of veterans and adventurers. Regulars are armed with short swords and chainmail, and are made up of around 4,000 men and women. The Royal Brigade has around 2,500 men and women, divided into three divisions. We are told that the entire force is trained in amphibious warfare, but we are not told what their outfitting consists of. What we are given is war machine statistics for both forces, with the regular force having a battle rating of 100 and a troop class of average, whilst the Royal Brigade has a battle rating of 177 and a troop class of excellent. The other four pages of the pullout section are allocated to being a bizarre flyer for attracting tourists to the island, consisting of a title page, some cursory information about the islands, and numerous want ads. This is, in my opinion, four wasted pages in a book already lacking so much information. 
And so we come to the end of my journey through this book, so I will, with more than a little pleasure, close the cover on Gazfor, the kingdom of Yerendi, and try to sum up my views and feelings. It breaks my heart to say it, because this is a Beckme product, but there is no way any form of bias can argue positively for this publication. It has to be one of the worst campaign sourcebooks ever produced. From its strange decision to make Eärendi a tourist destination in a medieval fantasy setting, to its apparent ignorance of a Makai culture that it presented and then left in the background. The populations on the islands demonstrate little cohesion. It's as if the author had ideas pop into her head and just went with them. I would say she was probably let down by the production crew, who should have been all over this and demanded better, but I'm ignorant of the setup so I can't criticise this any further. If I were to focus on the elements I really dislike, it would be the weird and wacky Gastonews world of adventure, and the bizarre 80s TV parodies of Fantasy Island and Magnum P.I. I mean, having a theme park reminiscent of Wally World in a D&D setting is one thing, but chucking in Friday night's television favourites? I'm surprised we didn't get a head guardsman called Stevie O'Magarito, who'd turn to his trusty elven lieutenant, arresting near do wells while saying, Book em, Dano. There were some real interesting subjects that were not capitalised on, though, such as exploiting the volcanism of the islands to have more of an impact on Eärendi's way of life. I've just realised that there's not one mention of a hot spring or a volcanic spa. What kind of tourist destination is this? Seriously, though, Iceland might have been the perfect inspiration for this book, and it appears that there was no research done, or if there was, it's not obvious. Bizarrely, I thought the gritty introduction of child trafficking on Alcove Island one of the most interesting concepts. It's not really palatable in modern publications to have this kind of thing mentioned, but this was an awareness of a reality that, unfortunately, has always been around and is pervasive to this day. What better cause is there than for heroic characters to put an end to such vile practices? And we used to see our heroes on the silver screen deal with this subject, such as the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, or Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. The text alluding to the capturing of children to sell to pirates is probably the best demonstration of this book having been written in the 80s than any reference to TV performances, in that it assumed the audience was mature enough to deal with the subject matter. For that reason, I actually give it credit, however abhorrent the actual practice of child trafficking is. Well, that brings me to the end of this rather lengthy review. Apologies, but it was really due to the product being so full of holes. I won't labour it any further, you've heard me ramble on enough. Gazfor, the kingdom of Eärendi, is a poor companion to the three that came before it. I really hope that Gaz 5 redeems the series. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please like and subscribe if you think I deserve your future attention as I continue my trip through the Gazetteers. If you enjoyed this video and wish to say thank you and support my channel further, then please consider buying me a coffee, link on the screen and in the description. Otherwise, I'm Beckme Berserker. Keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.